research project at the moment involves using a study of transnational black classicisms to construct an expanded classical tradition. Although Herodotus is not one of the authors who I'm studying as part of this project, he certainly could have been. In the spirit of the helpline, what I want to do today is to put together some ideas for teaching Herodotus in the context of debates, very current debates for us, about decolonizing classics, drawing on my research interests in Black Studies. If these ideas are useful, I hope that others will free, feel free to experiment with them in their own teaching, and I hope for myself that the discussion today will help me to refine and refresh some of these ideas. In modern Herodotian scholarship, Herodotus's work has long been recognized as a site of intense cross-cultural engagement in which Herodotus not only tests Greek knowledge about other peoples, but also tries to modulate patterns in Greek thought with critical non-Greek difference. Structuralist anthropology has had a significant influence on Herodotus, Herodotian studies in this regard, represented by James Redfield's 1985 essay, Herodotus the Tourist, and then again from the perspective of anthropology, Marshall Salins's Apologies to Thucydides. Beyond anthropology, the cultural antinomies of structuralist thought were developed in nuance in Francois Artaud's 1980 study, The Miroir des Redoutes, and in Paul Cartledge's 1993 book, The Greeks and the Other. Subsequent scholarship sought to traverse and unsettle these binaries by placing greater emphasis on exile and travel, making Herodotus a more fugitive author and the text a more wandering text. In this context, I think then of Francois Tog's re-envisioning of Herodotus in his subsequent 2001 book, Memories of Odysseus, published in French in 1996, where he developed the thesis that Herodotus was a frontier man, a non frontier, in a tradition culminating in the mobile exilic uh, writers of imperial Greek literature, like Dio Chrysostom. The idea of Herodotus's work as an example of fugitive study, and I take this term from Black Studies, is also present in Herodotian scholarship that has read Herodotus in light of anti-colonial and post-colonial thought. Here we might think of Pascal Payen's 1997 study, Les Îles Nomades, uh, that draws on discourses of nomadology informed by resistance to French rule in North Africa, as well as Rachel Friedman's analysis of Herodotus in comparison with Michael Ondaatje's The English Patient, which sees migrancy, displacement, and nostalgia for a stable home as recurring states in Herodotus's histories and relates them to debates about post-colonial situatedness. And while I'm on the subject of Michael Ondaatje's The English Patient, and at the risk of embarrassing one of our organizers, I want to say that it matters what conferanda we use in our research and teaching. I still very vividly remember as a young graduate student at Cambridge, stumbling upon Tom Harrison's article on Herodotus and the English patient in the journal Classics Island. It was published in 1998. And in that moment, the discipline rearranged itself a little for me uh, and encouraged me to think that thinking about post-colonial thought didn't have to be underground or marginal, and that classics wasn't fenced off from these terrain. Returning to my brief survey of Herodotus as an author who's an accessory to decolonizing knowledge rather than a target of decolonization, I would characterize where we are now in Herodotian studies as a result of all the studies that I've mentioned as being in the intellectual space opened up by Rosaria Munson's 2001 work telling wonders, ethnographic and political discourse in the work of Herodotus, as well as her 2005 study, Blacks Dove Speak. In the first book, Rosaria Munson examined Herodotus's consistent critique of the parochial limitations of Greek knowledge about other peoples. And in the second book, Black Dove Speak, Munson supplemented this analysis by arguing that Herodotus insists on the distribution of intellectual competences across culture. Francois Artaud's idea of Herodotus as a frontier man is still in play, I would argue, and perhaps finds an analogy in the concept of border thinking or border gnosis, expounded by the Argentinian theorist Walter Mignolo in his 2000 work, Local Histories, Global Designs, Coloniality, Subaltern Knowledges, and Border Thinking. In Walter Mignolo's conception, border thinking or border gnosis arises out of a recognition of colonial difference 
where colonial difference is the zone in which the coloniality of power is expressed. And I quote, the colonial difference, Mignolo writes, is the space where local histories inventing and implementing global designs meet local histories, the space in which global designs have to be adapted, adopted, rejected, integrated, or ignored, end of quotation. While Mignolo is talking about the modern world system, starting with Spanish colonialism in Mesoamerica, he goes back to the Greeks, citing Valentin Madimbi's book, The Invention of Africa, Gnosis, Philosophy, and the Order of Knowledge, as a co-traveler, where both thinkers think about Gnosis, uh, thinking back to Gnosticism, and underground um, or counter-epistemological traditions of knowledge. I draw this connection between Francois Artaud, Rosario Munson, and Walter Mignolo to illustrate parallel disciplinary dialogues and their conceptual intersections, as well as their mutual investments in anti-colonial and post-colonial thought. While we might argue that the Herodotus of contemporary Herodotian studies is already decolonized, I think that we sometimes lose sight in our scholarship and research and teaching of the different histories of modern colonization and empire that provoked the very epistemologies of resistance that have brought us to the point of scholarship at which we stand today. If I said before that one can't or one should not do Herodotian studies alone, the corollary is that we need to watch out for a disciplinary solipsism in which classics and ancient Mediterranean studies are not always explicit about their traffic with other disciplines, in this case with post-colonial studies. In thinking about inclusive teaching in the classics classroom, I think it's helpful, very helpful, to think about the exclusionary effects of what has been called the hidden curriculum in educational theory, and in educational theory, the phrase, the hidden curriculum, usually refers to the implicit cultural or institutional knowledge that is not passed on in the classroom, but which instructors assume their students already know, or maybe intimate that their students should know. I'd like to suggest though that there's a, another way of construing the phrase, the hidden curriculum, which is in terms of overlooking or devaluing sources of knowledge that are considered in some way less classical, or less necessary to mention. It's, um, I suppose, uh, an unintended um, effect of making certain disciplines invisible or, or reasserting a hierarchy of knowledge, which is one of the extrinsic critiques for us in classics and Mediterranean studies in the eyes of many other disciplines in humanities and social sciences, that we still operate with a classicizing hierarchy of knowledge, which we're at the top. So at this point, I'd like to turn to the topic of Herodotus in Black Studies and Herodotus and Black Studies, and both conjunctions, uh, prepositions and conjunctions are important for me. I use Black Studies as a transnational designation to encompass debates about Herodotus that are more specific to African-American studies, as well as debates that represent important theoretical approaches on both sides of the Atlantic. And when I say both sides of the Atlantic, I'm referring to uh, the Americas, uh, Europe, and, and Africa, primarily. I want first to briefly consider the way in which Herodotus has been a cardinal authority in the search for a usable past in Pan-African and Afrocentric thought. I don't want to rehearse excellent work that has already been done in this field, and there's a lot of it, so instead I'm going to point to this work and briefly discuss its significance before offering an example of my own. I'll then suggest that we need a wider and more supple and subtle understanding of the potential intersections of Herodotus and Black Studies and the potential for reciprocal dialogue. No one owns Herodotus. His work is an terma or an antique terma. While Herodotus has been mined for tropes and we could think about uh, medieval uh, books, medieval handbooks. He's been mined for sort of crude stereotypes of thinking about the peoples of the frontiers. His work as a whole is hard to recruit to a homogeneous cause, particularly where racial sciences are concerned. Hence, since the 18th century, racist thinkers have mined the histories for quotations to shore up, shore up crude stories of environmental determinism, and black abolitionists and race men have used Herodotus as an authority on the ancient civilizations of Africa in an attempt to repudiate anti-black stereotypes in modernity. 
As Wilson Jeremiah Moses suggested in his 1998 book, Afrotopia, these seemingly antithetical readings are not as paradoxical as they might appear because both are products of the same European ethnological sciences. The one promulgating this science and the other formulating a counter theory of racial worth in opposition to racist critique. But the point is that they're both deeply embroiled in sciences of race. This is the context of the Herodotus of the Pan-African movement and later of Afrocentric thought. Wilson Jeremiah Moses has little patience with this co-optation of Herodotus into a usable past for Afrocentric identity, commenting, and I quote, since the 1820s, Afrocentrists have displayed remarkable exegetical prowess on those few passages in Herodotus that are susceptible to interpretation as implying Egyptian or Upper Nile origins for early Mediterranean civilization, end of quotation. And Moses goes even less patient as his book goes on. Uh, in the conclusion of Afrotopia, he writes, and I quote, I have made no attempt to revisit discussions of Herodotus and Diodorus Siculus, who've been discussed with numbing repetitiveness by Egyptocentrists since Volney mentioned them in the, 19th, in the 18th century. Nothing new has been said of these authors since Volney, and the possibility that anything new will ever be said is remote. End of quotation. So in Moses' analysis, um, David Walker, Edward Wilmot Blyden, James Africanus, Bill Horton, and Alexander Crummel had all had recourse to Herodotus in the context of a vindicationist history. And here I'll share my slides. I just have a few slides. Um, so here we see um, Edward Wilmot Blyden, Edward Wilmot Blyden. At the top, James Africanus, Bill Horton, uh, then below him, Alexander Crummel, and then on the right, Martin Robson Delaney. Um, Moses explains vindicationist history as a practice of history intended to vindicate Africans and people of African descent from the racist stereotypes and racist histories that have been used to describe them. And he glosses this further as um, writing African history in an heroic or monumental mode. More specifically, Moses labels the strand of indications history under the term heroic monumentalism. In an article entitled Black Minerva, Antiquity and Antebellum African American History, the historian Margaret Malamud offers an excellent discussion of the use of Herodotus in 19th century African American letters in order to expound a racial connection between the Africans of modernity and the ancient Egyptians. Malamud also points out counter ideological moves in the developing science of Egyptology in the United States, moves intended to race the Egyptians as Caucasian. And she cites and draws on Scott Trafton's work, Egypt Land, Race and 19th Century American Egyptomania. Malamud brings out more explicitly than previous discussions the significance of Comte de Volney's The Ruins, published in 1791, whose full title was The Ruins or Meditations on the Revolutions of Empire. It was translated into English in 1802. And um, as Malamud explains, uh, Volney's The Ruins had a, a very long range influence for African-American receptions of Herodotus. Uh, it's not just that they were able to draw on Volney's uh, highlighting of passages in Herodotus that pertained to the question of the Africanness of Egyptian civilization. But Malamud argues, I think very interestingly, that African-American thinkers were also interested by Volney's uh, use of temporality um, drawing on Herodotus, the idea of the, the cycle um, and expiration of, of great powers. Um, I quote from uh, John Levi Bernard, who has looked at this even more fully in a book published in 2018 entitled Empire of Ruin, Black Classicism and American Imperial Culture. Volney's Ruins, Barnard writes, held a special appeal for African-Americans First, it unambiguously acknowledged ancient black civilizations in Africa, attributing to these African societies those civil and religious systems which still govern the universe, and the decline of these civilizations in the context of a revolutionary theory of history implied the possibility of the re-emergence of both Africans and African Americans. Antebellum African American writers embraced this view of the course of empire 
from human greed to slavery, tyranny, and ruin in order to develop an alternative typology for the United States with respect to classical history. End of quotation. It's important to remember here that these African-American counter epistemologies were part of a transnational pan-African intellectual movement. Africanus Horton, for example, who drew on Herodotus for anti-imperial and anti-colonial counter readings in his 1868 work, West African Countries and Peoples, was a native of Sierra Leone, and Edward Wilmot Blyden emigrated from America to Liberia in 1850 and wrote his most important historiographical works in and from Liberia. Barbara Goff discusses Horton and Blyden in her study of classics in the British colonies of West Africa and gives a fascinating account of Blyden's reading of the dialogue between the long-lived Ethiopians and Cambyses spies in Herodotus Book 3, chapters 17 to 25. And in this context, I'd like to note that while Wilson Jeremiah Moses might have lamented what he called the exegetical dead end of Afrocentric readings of Herodotus, there are all kinds of strategic subtleties going on in Afrocentric readings of passages like Herodotus Book 3, chapter 17 to 25. And uh, although this is not part of Moses's ken, in contemporary Herodotian studies, I think we're seeing, continuing to see very interesting rethinkings of what these passages are doing. So here I think, for example, of Liz Irwin's discussion in her article, Ethnography and Empire, Homer and the Hippocratics in Herodotus' Egyptian Logos, Book 3, chapter 17 to 26, which was published in Histos in 2014. And I think of a forthcoming discussion by Sarah Durbau in a chapter entitled Beyond Blackness, Reorienting Greek Geography, in which Durbau reads this passage in dialogue with Herodotus's depictions of Scythian resistance. Um, this chapter is going to appear in Sarah Durbau's book, Untangling Blackness in Greek Antiquity, which is forthcoming from Cambridge University Press. The point I, I want to make, and it will bring us back to the influence of post-colonial theory in contemporary Herodotian studies, is that the ideology of pan-African engagements with Herodotus is a response to ideological uses of classics, classics raced as white and European in the dominant cultures of the time. As Magan Keita argued in his contribution to the volume African Athena, that's the same volume in which Margaret Malamud's chapter was published, the tendency to write down and disparage Afrocentric engagements with classical sources on grounds of ideology is a partial accounting in that it leaves the accountability of Eurocentrism out of the picture. Kaita further notes, and I quote, the engagement with Africans in classical space is an engagement with a concept, the classical, created by the modern mind, a concept at times imbibed with certain racialized presuppositions. The recognition of this, and then the willingness to posit Africans in a classical space, is a challenge to one of the structural devices that has sustained modernity, i.e. race and its attendant forms, and to the vehicle of modern expansion, imperialism." End of quotation. The insight that I want to underscore here is Kaita's observation that post-colonial theory as we know it is very much indebted to these early African-American thinkers who developed a system of epistemological resistance and a system of historiography, counter-historiography, that critics such as Andrew Seel have recognized as being post-colonial in its essence and implications. One of the best examples that I can think of to make this point is the first international conference of Negro writers and artists, the Congrès des écrivains et artistes noirs, held in Paris in September 1956. Um, here you can see the uh, poster, which was designed by Pablo Picasso, and the hand uh, holding down the poster is the hand of uh, Mademoiselle Diop, who was uh, the, um, I think, uh, relative of Elion Diop, uh, who was one of the leaders of Présence Africaine and who presided over the conference. Um, the proceedings of this conference, if anyone is interested, are available online, uh, open access, um, and the proceedings were published uh, bilingually in English and French very soon after the conference. Um, James Baldwin also attended the conference and is an important source, and I'll, I'll talk about his testimony in a moment. He was uh, at the conference um, paid for by the uh, magazine Encounter, the US magazine Encounter, 
uh, and he published um, an essay reflecting on the conference entitled Princes and Powers in 1957. This conference was part of an important series of conferences that convened intellectuals, artists and politicians from across the black diaspora to address pan-African political collaboration, Negro rights, especially the right to political self-determination and Negro culture. Um, I suppose the closest example in Britain was a, a conference held in 1945 very soon after the end of the war in Chorley Medlock in Manchester, uh, which was a Pan-African conference, but not explicitly devoted to the arts and culture. At the Paris conference, an array of speakers, including Franz Fanon, Leopold Sédar Senghor, Aimé Césaire, Sheikh Anta Diop, and Richard Wright, debated the past, present, and future of Pan-African culture and thought. The papers delivered at this conference and the remarks in the discussion largely accepted a world-making model of culture, as defined by the philosophy of Hegel, a world-making model according which to have a culture, one had to have a civilization. And since not all civilizations are equal in this philosophy, the participants in the conference and the speakers devoted no little time to elaborating the historical significance of the Black world and offering a counter-narrative of the value of Black civilizations in the face of what Franz Fanon referred to, and I quote, as the unilaterally, unilaterally decreed normative value of certain cultures. At several turns, these discussions about the features of and requirements for a civilization evoked the civilizations of Greece and Rome. In some cases, this turn to classical antiquity involved citing Greek and Roman authorities as evidence for the importance of black civilization as in Sheikh Anta Diop's paper, from which I'll quote in a minute. While at other times, the discussion involved staking a counterclaim to the interpretation of classical antiquity in the face of claims made by European nations to the rights to classical heritage. In the Paris conference then, what we see is a complex, many-stranded classical tradition sh uh, shadowing the discussion of transnational black culture speakers at the conference debated the coherence of the idea of a black African civilization, which was expounded by Leopold Sedar Senghor, and they discussed its putative relationship to transnational black culture. In turn, this debate chipped away at the coherence of a racialized conception of a transnational Western civilization predicated on Greek and Roman classical antiquity, as the speakers reflected on what it means to posit a classical tradition and which nations get the right to do this. Um, I am not going to read um, these passages, um, but uh, I recommend Baldwin's uh, Princes and Powers, which was republished in his 1961 collection, Nobody Knows My Name, More Notes on a Native Son, and can be found in most volumes of Baldwin's collected essays, because Baldwin has very, very interesting comments um, about um, what it means to imagine a, a classical tradition. Um, and he concludes uh, that you know, if white classics exist, then black classics must also exist. This is a statement that Senghor had made. Um, he concludes um, that you know, this is you know, perhaps at the heart of, of the discussion at the Paris conference. The Senegalese historian and anthropologist Sheikh Anta Diop delivered a paper to the conference on the subject of the cultural contributions and prospects of Africa. I'll quote from the English translation of Diop's paper. In many ways, Diop's paper is a traditional vindicationist account, to use Moses's terminology. He cites Herodotus's Egyptian logos and Herodotus's discussions of the appearance and probable ethnicity of the Colchians at Book 2, Chapter 104. And he cites these alongside other classical sources such as Diodorus Siculus, Strabo, and Aeschylus and uses these sources as evidence for an argument for the Negro origin of Egyptian pharaonic civilization, qualifying, and I quote, it is important to make one major point clear straight away. If Egyptian civilization was Negro, that does not mean that all the Negroes now living on the continent took part in it in the same degree. Diop focuses on the passage of Herodotus, as I've said, 2.104, that is a locus classicus for Pan-African thought, 
I'll read from Robin Waterfield's translation, but I put both the Greek text and Waterfield's translation on the handout. For the fact is, as I first came to realize myself and then heard from others later, that the Colchians are obviously Egyptian. When the notion occurred to me, I asked both the Colchians and the Egyptians about it and found that the Colchians had better recall of the Egyptians than the Egyptians did of them. Some Egyptians said that they thought the Colchians originated with Sesostris's army, but I myself guessed their Egyptian origin, not only because the Colchians are dark skinned and curly haired, which does not count for much by itself because these features are common to others too, but more importantly, because Colchians, Egyptians, and Ethiopians are the only peoples in the world who practice circumcision and have always done so. Diop argues, eliding Herodotus's observations about the Colchians into an observation about the Egyptians, and I quote, Herodotus was an Indo-European. He therefore had no interest in asserting that the Egyptians had dark skin and curly hair, that they were Negroes and that it was they who had civilized the Mediterranean world, if it was not true. One can no longer doubt the value of these arguments. If it was a question of analyzing complex facts, facts of a social nature or some other nature, it might have been possible to cast doubt on them. But one must at least admit that a traveler who arrives in a country is capable of recognizing the color of the inhabitant's skin. And it is merely an observation of this kind which Herodotus makes. When Herodotus, this is still Diop, when Herodotus employs the root melanos, the strongest root word which existed in Greek to describe a Negro, modern scholars translate by bronze skin or sunburnt skin. But let justice be done. There are some scholars of good faith. I will give you proof. A member of the Institute traveled in Egypt between 1783 and 1785. I refer to Volney, the famous scholar Volney. Diop then cites a passage from Volney in which Volney leaps from the sculpted appearance of the Sphinx to Herodotus's description of the features of the Colchians to argue that the ancient Egyptians were real Negroes like all the natives of Africa. I quote Sheikh Antidiop's presentation of this familiar argument, not because of the content of the argument, but because of the way in which he frames it. As Fonce Fanon and Leopold Sedar Senghor argued at the same conference, one of the primary issues in the articulation of Negro culture in Paris in 1956 was the argument from classical priority made by European empires, used both as an argument against political independence and to devalue African cultures and languages. Hence Diop remarks, the Egyptian experiment was essentially Negro and that all Africans can draw the same moral advantage from it that Westerners draw from Greco-Latin civilization. And it's that argument about uh, moral advantage and the parallelism uh, about these ideological um, uses of the classical past uh, in counter ideological senses that present themselves as um, ethical, ethical arguments. At a time in which we're reckoning with the entanglements of classics and ancient Mediterranean studies with different usable paths and what this means and has meant for the cultural identity of our disciplines, both intrinsic and extrinsic, I think the passages like Herodotus 2, 104 present us with an important opportunity to reflect on the interpretive histories of the text that we read and to do this in an expanded act of commentary, who has read these texts before us and how and where and how have they been used. These I think are important data about the context for the history of scholarship and the role that readers, including formal scholars, play in the construction of meaning. If we find post-colonial approaches to Herodotus's histories more compelling than Afrocentric engagements with Herodotus, we do at least need to connect the two and understand the latter as part of an anti and post-colonial arc. I want to offer a second example in a different vein of teaching Herodotus's histories, this time in light of Black Studies, uh, rather than thinking specifically about uh, transnational Afrocentric thought and Pan-Africanism. For this, I've chosen a striking passage from the beginning of Herodotus's Scythian Logos, which reflects on Greek ideologies of domination and slavery. One of the folds in his histories, the beginning of book four in modern editions of Herodotus's texts, Herodotus gives us a striking ethnographic digression. In introducing the Logos about the Scythians, 
Herodotus introduces them as the soon-to-be target of Persian imperial conquest, explaining that Darius was planning an expedition against them. He then pauses this narrative trajectory to recount a tale of how the men of Scythia, who'd been absent for 28 years, fighting against the Medes, returned to find that the women of Scythia had paired up with their slaves, Duloi, and given birth to a new mixed generation. When the Scythian men return, this new generation resists them in battle. I provided the Greek text of sections three to four of book four on the handout. And again, I'll read from Robin Waterfield's translation. So a whole new generation had grown up with these slaves and the Scythian women as their parents. And when they discovered the circumstances of their birth, they set about resisting the return of the Scythians from Media. The first thing they did was to isolate their country by digging a wide trench all the way from the Taurian mountains to the widest part of Lake Moetus. And then they took up defensive positions and resisted the attempted invasions of the returning Scythians. Several engagements took place, but military tactics were getting the Scythians nowhere. So one of their number came up with an alternative. Fellow Scythians, he said, look at what we're doing. In this war against our own slaves, we can either kill or be killed. If we're killed, there'll be fewer of us. And if we kill them, there'll be fewer of them for us to command. So I think we should abandon our spears and bows, take up our horsewhips instead and pitch into them. All this time they've been seeing us bearing arms against them as though they were our equals and sons of men as good as us. But the sight of us bearing whips instead of weapons will teach them that they are our slaves. And when they've learned this, they won't resist us. The Scythians put this plan into action. Their opponents were so confused by the turn of events that they forgot about fighting and fled. That is how the Scythians ruled over Asia and driven out of there by the Medes, returned home. And so it was a desire to pay them back that led Darius to raise an army against them. This passage was discussed by Moses Finley in an important discussion in Ancient Slavery and Modern Ideology in 1980, where Finley argues for using the language of racism, as I quote, as a logical consequence of the slave outsider equation in ancient Greek and Roman societies. Francois Artaug and Rosaria Munson have discussed this passage more extensively, commenting on the significance of the whip and the ideology of mastery of despotism. Both Artaug and Munson draw parallels with Herodotus 683, where Herodotus recounts the enslaved population of Argos taking over the government of the city due to the depopulation that ensued after the Battle of Sopea in the 470s BC. In that context, where the sons, when the sons of the dead Argive men grow up, they fight the former slaves for control of the city and succeed in driving them out and gaining control. My focus here will be a little different. I want to look at the circular loop between ancient Greek thought as suggested by literature and visual and material culture on the one hand, and theoretical responses to the historical experience of slavery in the Americas on the other hand. I want to suggest some tools that Black Studies might give us to expand the interpretation of this passage, while pointing out at the same time how work on ancient Greek and Roman slavery has informed Black Studies. I'm interested in this passage, in the semiotic process through which an enslaved human being is enunciated, or we might say called out or interpolated, as an animal, and the role of tense and temporality in this process. I want to suggest that in addition to reading this passage as a source for the ideology of mastery, we can also read it, and this reading might be more in keeping with Herodotus's historical interpretation, as a reflection on the instability of domination. One conclusion we might draw from this passage then is that the artificial anti-human branding of another human being as an animal is temporally unstable. It requires a number of iterative speech acts that describe and address the slave as animal, reinforced by nonverbal acts of violence against the bodies of the enslaved that evoke the whipping, branding, and restraining of livestock. Through frequent repetition, the compound of verbal and physical violence, what we might call phonic materiality, to use a phrase that Fred Moten coined, this compound of verbal and physical violence inscribes the normative construction of the slave as an animal in a metaphor whose violence persists to the present in racial stereotypes. And um, that phrase, phonic materiality, comes from Fred Moten's 2003 study in The Break, which he begins 
by analyzing and reflecting on Saidiya Hartman's discussion, this is a bit uh, <laughs> serial, um, Saidiya Hartman's discussion in the book Scenes of Subjection of the passage in Frederick Douglass's narrative of 1845, in which he recounts his memory of hiding in a cupboard and hearing the screams of his aunt Hester being whipped. In Herodotus, we have the commonplace, commonplace in Greek texts of the enslaved as animal-like, responding to a split semiotic system at the intersection of human and animal. The free human part of the young men's ancestry conditions them to fight the returning Scythians as the same as them, homoios, and their enslaved ancestry preconditions them to recognize the whip, the mastix. What interests me here is the temporality, what we might call the slave moment, implied by the tense structure in Herodotus's Greek. In the speech spoken by an anonymous Scythian, we have two verbs in the imperfect tense to describe the young men's perception of themselves, horon and enomidzon. We could translate these instances of the past continuous tense as, as long as they saw us, mechri, and they were in the habit of thinking that, in our mid zone. Then we have another temporal clause with the temporal conjunction and the subjunctive, but when they see us, followed by two aorist participles, athontes and nontes, they will not stand up to us. They'll learn and uh, understand and they will not stand up to us. The Scythian men put their plan into action and the effect of brandishing the whip is apparently instantaneous, striking the young men out of their wits. An aorist participle is used, et plangentes, and they end up as a result fleeing. Used here, the aorist aspect of the verb suggests perhaps a sudden action interrupting a continuum. The young men are called out, they're semiotically distracted by a form of address that puts them apart from the men whom they're fighting. Linguistically, the use of the whip, semiotically, I should say, the use of the whip as a verb visual message, arrests the young men in much the same way as a whip would arrest them. Herodotus, as we know, is fascinated with the interactional and performative nature of language and its role in constructing intrasubjective human identities. I read this passage at another level as a Herodotian insight into how language acts, including semiotic sign systems, serially constitute the slave effect through a series of punctuated moments that work to overwhelm durative identities in the case of those who can remember another temporal identity. And here I'm influenced by an article published in 2000 by Walter Johnson with the title Possible Past, Some Speculations on Time, Temporality and the History of Atlantic Slavery, in which Johnson writes about the circum-Atlantic experience of slavery as the slave owners and the enslaved struggling for control of time, each trying to drag the other into another place in time. We can also use this passage of Herodotus to think further about the key word that best names the commonplace of the slave as an infrahuman creature. This is the neuter adjectival substantive, andropodon, described or translated as a man-footed thing. Building on my reading of this passage, I'd like to use temporality to complicate and disrupt the idea that andropodon was a stable category, suggesting instead that its very invention as a term speaks precisely to the question of the temporal contingency, contingency of the condition of enslavement. Andropodon is widely cited as the epitome of the culture of bestializing slaves born out of an ideology of domination. In her 2012 book, Reconstructing the Slave, the Image of the Slave in Ancient Greece, Kelly Rainhaven explains, due to its relationship with tetrapodon, literally four-footed thing, livestock, Andropodon, or man-footed thing, is by far the most potent illustration of the conception of the slave as animal-like. Renhaven further notes that the context in which this term is used most consistently is in the context of warfare, where it refers to those captured in war, often alongside baggage animals. In his 2006 book, In Human Bondage, The Rise and Fall of Slavery in the New World, David Brion Davis drew parallels between Greek discussions of the slave as andropodon and the infamous passage from Frederick Douglass's narrative in which Douglass recounted his initial meeting with the slave breaker, Mr. Covey, who was paid to tame and to break him on an, a direct analogy with a beast of burden, eliciting the plangent cry in Douglass's narrative, behold a man transformed into a brute. 
The cross-fertilization between scholarship on modern American and ancient Greek and Roman slavery is made explicit uh, by David Brion Davis when he cites Keith, Keith Bradley's article on animalizing the slave um, and constructs a, a sort of circular reciprocal dialogue between slavery ancient and modern. And I could also think here as well of uh, works in classical scholarship like Paul Cartledge's Rebels and Sambas um, and uh, his, his article on a heterology of classical Greek slavery. Um, I'm going to end in a couple of minutes. I think the um, further layer of argument that one could be, bring in here is a discussion by the scholar Ray Chow in her book, The Protestant Ethnic and the Spirit of Capitalism, where Ray Chow has a really nice discussion of what she calls a model of coercive mimeticism to explain a, a missing link as she sees it in Althusser's theory of interpolation. How do you get uh, subjects to consent to and recognize um, these states or the terms uh, by which they're invoked, particularly when these terms are, are negative? And she connects this to the idea of the stereotype uh, originally introduced uh, metaphorically by Walter Lippmann in a 1922 book where he drew on the idea of the stereotype from the fixed print type, uh, where it's a mass print type designed to duplicate pages of uh, text that are fixed in, in casts. And then Ray Chow develops this to think about the stereotype um, as a model for what she calls coercive mimeticism. And I'll read her definition. Coercive mimeticism is a process, identitarian, existential, cultural, or textual, in which those who are marginal to mainstream Western culture are expected by what Albert Nenny calls the mark of the plural to resemble and replicate the very banal preconceptions that have been appended to them. A process in which they're expected to objectify themselves in accordance with the already seen and thus to authenticate the familiar imagining themselves of ethnic. Mutatis mutandis, with some important exceptions. I think this idea of coercive mimeticism is uh, really interesting for thinking about the production of the monastics, the whip, uh, in this passage in Herodotus and its effects. So I'll conclude. Classics is definitionally ambiguous as a discipline, thanks to a nomenclature that blurs the description of its scope. different communities in history have accorded to Greek and Roman antiquity. These historical soundings, some of which I've offered in this paper, affinities in classics to vindicate uh, status in the present, inform as well the logic that departments of classics use to explain their importance, and they tell in the analogies and comparisons that we use to relay our subjects. The decision to illustrate aspects of ancient Greek literature through, just to give some example, analogies with Oscar Wilde, W.H. Jordan, Melvin Tolson, or Wally Schoenke, is a matter of intellectual affinity that both reflects and is constitutive of a continuing classical tradition. Likewise, the decision to frame Latin literature through Dante, T.S. Eliot, uh, Borges, Gwendolyn Brooks, or Joseph Brodsky is also a matter of intellectual affinity. Hence, uh, and if I can refer to one of our recent debates at this time in, in Britain, um, this is what I found to be the, the real disingenuousness of David Butterfield's claim in his article in the Spectator magazine last summer that, and I quote, the limits of the classics are bound by the obstinacy of the past, our hands are tied by the evidence that happens to exist, end of quotation. I vividly recall as part of my own undergraduate education that the comparative frameworks through which classics was relayed to us, often very subtly, simply by uh, epigraphs, quotations that were included at the top of handouts or remarks or analogies or comparisons that were, were mentioned in passing. This was a, a very, very important part of uh, the feel, the cultural feel of my undergraduate experience and how I sort of um, experienced the subject. As a, a young black British student as well, the fact that some of the lecturers who taught me included works by C.L.R. James or Edward Said or Orlando Patterson or Gabriel Garcia Marquez or David Walcott on their lecture handouts was critical for signaling that knowledge of colonialism in British Britain's empire 
was germane to the study of classics in the modern world, and in comparative terms, that the circum-Atlantic slave trade might inform the study of slavery in ancient Greece and Rome. So I haven't always put this to practice, put this into practice in my own teaching, but I'm, I'm trying increasingly to be more explicit about the work that I do in so-called reception studies on black classicisms and the work that I do in more traditional conventional classics on Herodotus or on Thucydides and to try and lay bare the, the intersections and entanglements of the, the two as institutions of knowledge and their parallel sometimes joined histories. Okay, I'll stop there. I look forward to the discussion.